So with that, let me get started with the usual, our standing agenda item, which is the conceptual questions, just uh, checking it with the perplexity and uh, how well generative AI does in answering these questions. And I've been saying uh, quite a bit uh, <laughs> now that these are the questions I really do want to ask uh, perplexity with the GPT-4 to see how much better it is uh, since a year ago. You know, a year ago, they were, um, GPT, chat GPT was new. I think they really exploded into news uh, in November, December. So last year um, was really first semester where you, generative AI was any kind of use with uh, uh, our classes and, um, and you know, some of the modern physics questions, it wasn't doing so well. But um, now I'm inter interested in seeing how much better it is now a year ago. Uh, a year later. So let me start with the question one. Uh, so um, can the magnitude of wave function, that technically isn't the magnitude, but it's fine. Absolute, magnitude would be absolute value. Uh, so, you know, you have to take square root, but it's fine. So that is absolute value, psi xt, psi squared, which is defined as psi complex conjugate xt, times, oh, uh, psi. I think uh, it'll understand this uh, exponent. This is a complex conjugate, not something else. Uh, be a negative number, yeah. I think it'll answer that well. That feels like a easy kind of question that generative AI does it well on. So, it's been slow today. Uh, I noticed with uh, my other class that it was taking double the amount of time it usually takes to answer questions. So, um, I could just be silent. That'll help me uh, edit this video later. Maybe I'll try that. Ne next question, I'll just uh, not say anything while I, it's doing this so that I can just easily edit that out uh, when I'm editing the video. Magnitude represented as that. Cannot be a negative number. Because, yeah, magnitude squared, yeah, that's the actually meaningful quantity. Oh, it's going mathematical route. Uh, sure, you can justify that mathematically. Uh, crucial because, yeah, yeah. And this is the physical justification for that. And the physical justification is important because, uh, so in relativistic quantum mechanics, this actually becomes a real issue. People try to construct a mathematical um, quantity that would represent the probability density, and they keep getting a number that could be a negative. And uh, it's uh, outside the scope of what we cover in this class, but in relativistic quantum mechanics, actually being able to build a kind of probability density as some kind of a mathematically meaningful operation, that does become an issue for people to tackle. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's a good answer. Um, yeah, yeah. It's giving me both the mathematical re reason for it and the physical reason for why we need a mathematical operation that will always be positive, positive definite. So that's why you know when you have complex wave function, you can't just square it. You have to do this absolute value square that's mathematically guaranteed to be positive. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next question, and I'll just uh, be silent, not say anything to help with the editing. Uh, while well, uh, perplexity is answering. So it's A, B, potential inside the world. All right, and I'll just not say anything. All right, let's look. So yeah, localized free particle. This was the whole point of the, the simulation lab that we did that um, there's a, once you treat particle as a wave, there's a like mathematical connection between its uncertainty wavelength and the uncertainty in position. So um, you cannot measure the energy with a complete precision. If you can, it's not going to be localized. It will be over all space. So yeah, it's not possible to measure. Yeah, good, good, good. Uncertainty principle and also treatment of particle as a wave. It's like that's tied together. Now B is going to be surprising. Uh, let's see if it answers correctly. Yeah. Localization of square oil, the energy. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, those are the energy eigenstates. 
So you've seen infinite square well problem. You've found the energy levels. Those energy levels can be determined with a complete precision, zero uncertainty. So yeah, quantize the energy levels. Yeah, that's great. Quantitational. Now, does it explain it? Um, I guess I didn't ask you to explain if it's possible, so maybe not. Uh, uh, non quantum yeah, so yeah, once it's a superposition, then uncertainty comes in. Now, so you might think then, uh, does this mean the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is violated? And the answer is no, because when you look at the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the statement of that involves these quantities. The uncertainty momentum, so localization, so you know, with the the, that solution for the infinite square well, you could say, yeah, this delta x is around the only order of magnitude of the size of the well. That times the uncertainty in momentum, not in uncertainty in energy, and that actually makes a difference. That is greater than or equal to h bar over 2. And the thing is, uh, with the infinite square well, basically what you have looks like uh, uh, standing waves. That's what it looks like. And you might remember from physics 4a that standing wave involves two kind of counter propagating waves. So for the solution that you build for these, you actually have uncertainty. So you know you might say the magnitude of momentum is h over lambda, but the components that make this up it involves both the positive and negative. So you can assign an uncertainty in momentum there. That's actually on the order of magnitude as its side magnitude of the momentum. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is still completely obeyed. Now there's a version of it that looks like this: uncertainty in energy and some sort of lifetime uh, product of those is greater than or equal to h bar over two. So when we say the uncertainty in energy is um, like zero. What we do imply is that the lifetime of that state is infinite. Now, in a real system, the excited states won't have infinite lifetime. So, um, so, so, so we do those finite lifetimes. Yeah, then that broadens your energy level. So, uh, but that's not <laughs> what the question is asking. So, for the purpose of what the question is asking, yeah, you can completely determine your um, uh, energy, uh, no uncertainty whatsoever. That is possible. And the sensor is great. All right, let me ask the next question. And uh, the, the purple exit is bogging out a little bit today. Let's see if uh, it'll answer this question properly and not confuse it with our earlier question. We'll see. All right, let's look. So yeah, <laughs> the stationary state. I have to say it's a stationary in the sense that expectation values are not a function of time. <laughs> but that's a, not an appropriate, level appropriate answer for this class. So let's see. Uh, let me read the perplexity response and then I'll give my critique of that. It's a lot easier that way. Uh, particle in a state, in a energy eigenstate, yeah, that's a synonym of a stationary state. Stationary in the quantum mechanical sense. All right, that's good introduction. Time independent probability density, yeah, that's good. So when you do this calculation, that if that has any time dependence, that's not a stationary state. It's the, the kind of the, now it's different from saying the wave function itself, it doesn't depend on time. It'll depend on time, and it depends on time in this exact way. And this is where energy eigenstate is associated with a stationary state. You can write this down only for energy eigenstates. Um, because the if you have a superposition of different energy states, then this factor will be different, and um, you won't have uh, the time-dependent wave function in this form. So yeah, that's good so far. And so far, I don't think it has used any uh, terminology that's above our class's level. So so far, so good. Yeah, it depends includes a time-dependent vector that's uh, completely uh, predictable. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is kind of tying into what I mean. The expectation value of the um, observables is not time dependent. Yeah, physical interpretation, time stationary, observable property. Yeah, yeah. But, and now this is kind of getting a little bit above our class level, but to the extent that this makes sense, that's a good answer. Line, quantum behavior, dynamic elements. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, so this is where in the simulation lab you did this week, uh, you had a double well potential, where if you prepare a state uh, with a, all the particle in one well, that's the kind of mixture of two energy eigenstate that itself is not an energy eigenstate, then uh, you get kind of um, moving particle back and forth. And all of that becomes possible because each of the components have that phase factor. So, um, so it's a, like the, the phase factor being time dependent, it does have a physical effect if you set up a, set up a system to where that effect can come through. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is good answer. Um, yeah, again, this is really the reason I was excited to try <laughs> perplexity this semester because I don't think, I don't remember ChatGPT giving such a good answer to a question like this last time. Maybe I should go back and check, but this is a good answer. Yeah. All right, question number four. Let's see, fix the first excited state. Psi 2 has zero value. All right, let's see how it answers. All right, let's take a look. So this is <laughs> this first response um, in the way Wolfgang Pauli might say it's not even wrong. It's so off the wall, so unrelated to what's physically correct. But you know, like if it's a student asking the question, I won't say it's not even wrong. But it is a kind of... Um, problem of um, try understanding quantum mechanics on its own terms, not trying to fit it into our classical box. Um, yeah, let's see how perplex the answers and I'll give it critic. To, um, it, but my starting place would be, uh, this is kind of classically oriented reasoning process. Uh, they just throw that out the window and think about it in quantum mechanical terms. <laughs> so, Touches some fundamental nature of quantum particles, misconception arises. Yeah, you cannot apply classical intuition to quantum systems. Is it wrong? <laughs> um, yeah, in place, yeah. yeah. On the different, yeah. Zero potential point, yeah. That's the a node of a standing wave, yeah. Uh, does not have the same. Probably densities. Uh, okay, this is a little bit. Uh, I mean, Sure, um, but you can imagine having a like a you know infinitesimal interval where it's not quite zero but has some size so that you can have an infinitesimal probability and if it's zero. so this part I don't love because it's kind of hanging on a technicality that's actually not significant meaningful proper into sure or infinitesimal <laughs> you know that's close to zero but not quite zero. Yeah, this doesn't involve tunneling, so not relevant. Um, yeah. Although, uh, so the title is all wrong, but what it's saying is actually right. Quantum packer do not move between locations. In a, yeah, it doesn't have a trajectory, you might imagine. So, yeah, the particle crossing a point, it's not even the right question. <laughs> um, Particles wave function is yeah, spread out, and until you measure its position, it doesn't have a position. That's the orthodox, um, the orthodox Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. But the, the claim that it has anything to do with tunneling, um, no, that's wrong. This has nothing to do with the tunneling. So, yeah, it doesn't have to tunnel through a node. So they throw out the last part, and its answer so far is fine. Uh, throw out the last bit. Wave function, yeah. So this uh, kind of ties into um, adjusting your intuitive reasoning so that you think in quantum mechanical terms. So until you make a measurement, it doesn't make sense to talk about position of a particle as though it had an actual position. So you know, if a measurement is made, the wave function collapses, particle is found at a specific location, yeah. Before measurement, it doesn't have a position. It's the, the spread out wave thing. That is the particle. And you cannot think about it having a position before you actually make a measurement. And once you make a measurement, then the wave function you have is way different from that, uh, that the first excited state you had. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is a good answer. Yeah. yeah. So, 
Um, so the, I guess in all of this response, I would just throw out the first point. Just dealing with a mathematical technicality that doesn't um, cast any, it doesn't give you any physical insight, so not relevant. Second response, second point, it's good. Just to throw out the very last item there because that, that has nothing to do with the situation presented. This, uh, um, so, you know, thinking in these terms might make your head hurt. It's the kind of, you know, no pain, no gain. Because uh, adjusting your intuitive thinking from classical thinking to quantum mechanical thinking, it takes a lot of work. And uh, as you do that work, the what you, can, what you can rely on are your mathematical calculations. In physics, sometimes we have this phrase, shut up and calculate. <laughs> and uh, it's meant to be helpful. Um, shut up part refers to, you know, um, sometimes this kind of philosophical reasoning confuses people, even physicists. And when it confuses you, step away for a bit. Just uh, work on your calculation skills. You know, can you predict outcomes of experiments? And uh, hold on to that because being able to compare with the outcomes of experiments, that is really the one thing that uh, we, we rely on as uh, as you know, practitioners of experimental science, that is physics. So let me look at the conclusion. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's flawed due to misunderstanding quantum mechanics. Yeah, that's a good one sentence description. Yeah, yeah. So don't think in classical terms. Their behaviors, wave functions, yeah. Present, uh, yeah, good, good. I think conclusion is great. The summary is great. Good. All right, let's go to the last question and see... Um, how uh, it says, uh, in what ways was, uh, I don't remember what I put into the, uh, my model answer. So I hope, uh, um, chat, uh, GP2 will get it. The part that Planck's hypothesis was incorrect. So the way, uh, quantum harmon simple harmonic oscillators covered in chapter seven, you see this expression for energy. Let me write it down so that I can prove that I didn't, Look it up. I just wrote it down from memory. This is the energy levels of the quantum mechanical oscillator. N plus one half h bar omega. So this N h bar omega part, yeah, you can get that from what Planck had. You know, the energy levels of the oscillators are quantized. What Planck's model didn't have is this zero point energy. That comes out of the mathematical treatment, uh, either wave, fun wave mechanics or in upper division, I think um, a lot of the textbooks start out with the, the, um, the matrix mechanics, uh, like using raising and lowering operator and all that. And this uh, kind of um, zero point energy comes out of that. And this is not something that Planck would have guessed. It just comes out of the fully quantum mechanical treatment of the system. So let's see if... Uh, Perplexed, they got that. Quantitational energy, yeah, that's correct. Ah, it has this energy, so it might actually get the part where he got incorrect. Uh, foundation, yeah, yeah. The ideal photon kind of is motivated by uh, Planck's hypothesis. That's why we call H, you know, Planck's constant, because it's like the beginning. Um, lack of, yeah, that, I think we talked about that two weeks ago. Uh, application to body radiation. Um, oh yeah, sure. Phenomenologically correct, but not. So it's a, like an ad hoc assumption. All right, you could say that's a part of limitations. Okay. Uh, broader implication to quantum. Yeah. So. Hey, didn't uh, I guess um, so? There's a bit of an unfairness of what I'm looking for. I'm looking for this, um, you know, the the one half um, thing, and uh, the question is uh, posed as a kind of a broad question, and uh, it's probably not fair of me to look for this uh, specific factor. But it's fine. Uh, it, it, in its answer, it does have the correct formula. It simply didn't point out the discrepancy between what Planck would have guessed as the energy levels of the quantum mechanical oscillator. And he might have said, oh, up to some addition of a constant offset, maybe. But you know, this one half thing, it does depend on the the h bar omega. So it's not an actually constant offset. Because if you treat the frequency as a variable, then it is a variable offset. And um, yeah, 
So, so that's uh, what I think you will see in the model answer, me pointing to, well, that missing that uh, plus one half, yeah, that comes from the uh, fact of these other limitations. You know, Planck was making an ad hoc assumption, so it's not, um, it's not a fully quantum mechanical uh, theory model that is building. It's just introducing that ad hoc assumption. So, all right, that all looks good. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, these are all great answers with some minor tweaks, corrections that I was pointing out. Um, yeah, it's, um, I, I, so, so one thing that I was uh, saying that I want to do um, where I'm kind of picking up the pace a little bit so that I can cover some of the uh, optional assignments. And that's where I think I'm actually really excited to see how well perplex the answers. So that, that's where I'm looking forward to these two problem sets, which uh, normally I wouldn't get to because, you know, they are optional, you know, we are running out of time and all that. But I really do want to ask these nuclear physics and particle physics questions. And they all, these are some of the questions where uh, ChatGPT just wasn't getting right. So, so I want to ask and see how well does perplexity with the GPT-4 does. So.